Hello, and welcome to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum, Harnessing the Power of HR Technology. My name is Nick with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, and then we'll turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors, Alight, Eightfold AI, and GP. Our sponsors are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active on social media, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us at Argyle Exec Forum. Also, be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. I would like to take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we have curated based on the feedback we have received over the years from our members. We have worked closely with our speaking faculty to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the session today. And we appreciate our member support of this policy. Finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen. Following each presentation, we have set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on your questions. Thanks again for joining us today. Now, let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Michelle Miller, Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer, Carson Tahoe Health. We're super excited to have Michelle for her opening keynote presentation titled, Building a Culture of Trust to Achieve Talent Excellence. Welcome, Michelle. Over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And most importantly, you should thank yourself for investing this time in your personal and professional development. In today's presentation, we're going to talk about why the workforce is wary and steps you can take to start building trust today, how to understand and respond to the generational differences that affect us and the trust in the workplace that we're in. We're gonna talk through ways to be consistent and fair and how to empower your employees to become cultural ambassadors and creators. You ready? Let's go. First, we're gonna talk through that it starts with us. To have trust in the workplace, there's elements of culture, engagement, and productivity. But it starts with every single one of us at the individual level, the department level, and then the organizational level. Have you been in or are you in a company where they've reached out to you as an HR professional and asked you to put together an initiative to get culture going? You've got to be able to work with the leaders at that senior leadership table, the leaders in the departments to help them understand that it's not just HR that's going to be able to drive that culture. It's all of us. To have engagement in the workplace, everyone needs to be on board, not only to be able to create it, but to sustain it, which is that much more difficult. Technology is so important. That's a big reason why we're here today talking, but it's also important for those of you that are HR professionals or work with them, that the technology is great, but we can't entirely pull the human out of HR. And finally, for productivity, we're going to talk through ways that we can measure and hold people appropriately accountable. So think about who you are as a person, as a leader, and as an HR professional. Now think through some people that you've worked with before. Some of them may have left lasting impressions on you, good or bad. Have you ever had a leader that made you feel like maybe you were less than? A leader or a coworker that made you feel like you weren't good enough? Or maybe you weren't part of the club or some kind of inner circle click? I think a lot of us have been there at some point in time. So you should ask yourself, what kind of leader do you want to be? And maybe more importantly, what kind of leader don't you want to be? 
we've learned so much through the people that we've worked with before, things that we idolize, things that we look up to, things that we emulate, as well as the things we kind of vow to ourselves that we'll never do again. With those leaders or coworkers where we've had those unfortunate experiences, whether we realized it or not, there was a lack of transparency. Employees sense this through the inconsistent implementation of policies, procedures, and outcomes being different across an organization. Think about the organization that you're in right now. Do you have consistency across the board? Do you even have consistency in the team that you're in right now? This consistency needs to be all across all different elements of the organization. Think about your interviewing process. Does everyone get the same type of panel and questions? Your policies and procedures, are they applied the same way in every department? Do you have committees that are inclusive? And if they are, are they open to being able for people to share safely, freely, openly, to share their suggestions or their concerns? And lastly, think about the way that you communicate. If you're maybe in a 24 seven healthcare organization, an email probably isn't going to reach the emergency room nurse who's coming in and immediately triaging a very acute patient situation. So you need to think about that your communications need to reach everyone in your organization, and there can't just be one way of doing that. I wanted to share a quote that a great leader listens more than they speak. You can build trust through understanding. A great tip that I've learned and continue to practice is when I'm in that active listening moment, and just when I think it's time to reply, I pause and count to three. That gives the other person space to continue the conversation where they thought they might have been done, but they actually end up sharing so much more. And it opens up this wonderful safe space for them to share more. And you're learning something and understanding something that you wouldn't have if you were just listening with that intention to reply. Now we know we need to build trust. But why is the workforce continuously wary? Maybe they don't feel like they can speak up and express those concerns or make a recommendation without a fear of feeling put down or maybe even a sense of retaliation. Are they seeing leaders engage in gossip? Because that can be detrimental to your culture and engagement. Maybe they're too anxious to ask for help. That's a really vulnerable thing to do. And some people fear reporting incidents. If you work in HR, I'm sure you've heard before, I didn't wanna report it because I didn't wanna get in trouble. I didn't want the other person to get in trouble or I was scared of what was gonna happen if I said something. So we have to work on breaking down those walls so people feel safe to be able to share with us. Here's some tips on how we can build trust. Everyone's a VIP and not in the traditional sense. Yes, everyone's a very important person, but they're also a very individual person. Everyone has their story, their why they are the way they are, why they communicate the way they do, the things that they're motivated by, why they chose the job or the company that they're in. And if we can be present in each moment and actively listening and caring about who they are as an individual, we'll be able to understand that and be able to honor it throughout their career with us. As leaders, HR team members, we need to be vulnerable and open to feedback. Some of that's going to be some constructive criticism, and we're not always going to agree with it, but we have to be able to hear it. And we have to be able to identify that maybe I didn't agree with it the first time, but if I'm hearing it a second or third time, 
there's a pattern starting and I need to look inward of what do I need to do differently to change that perception. This one's hard. You need to admit when you don't know something. And I need you to be able to understand that you don't need to know everything. It's okay to not know everything. Perfection doesn't exist. So it's okay to say, well, that's a great question. I'm not sure what the answer is. Let me go do some research. Maybe you need to ask for help to be able to find the solution for that person. And being able to ask for help is hard. I'm not going to say I'm perfect. It's continuously a challenge for most people because it's one of your most vulnerable moments to ask for help, personally or professionally. But the trust you can build with someone when you ask for help, wow, they trust me to help them. That can really create a bridge that wasn't there before. Some additional tips is to be neutral. You have to hold everyone accountable the same way. And that's gonna set the tone. So some of my team members see some of the tone that I've set. Maybe there've been team members on teams that I've led before where, oh gosh, you know, they noticed so-and-so maybe didn't show up on time regularly. And over time, maybe that person wasn't with the organization anymore or they saw a different level of performance. And that different level of performance, if it didn't change, those people aren't on the team anymore. That sets a tone. That sets an expectation of what I need out of the people that I'm gonna be working with. The goal isn't just for me to be successful. The goal is for us to be successful as a team. And once they see that, they're gonna be able to understand so much more clearly what it is that you need as a leader. You also need to let your actions match your words. You can't say, do as I say, not as I do. Um, that's a famous parenting tactic and in some places still a leadership tactic, but you have to lead by example. I can't say I'm all about my organization's mission, vision and values if I don't live and breathe that with every single thing that I say and do in my organization. You need to realize the effect that you have on other people. This one was something that I've even felt more recently. I've been in HR for 15 years. I've been an executive for almost half of that now. And I've worked so hard that entire time to make sure that, you know, I could lead without a title. And now that I have a title, I'm still a leader, of course, but I try not to see myself differently than other people. But the reality is other people see me differently. I have a vice president title. I have a chief title. And especially when you're in HR and or a leadership role, people have you up on a pedestal. People are holding on to every single thing that you say you need, that you do. And you have to just constantly be leading by that example, your policies, your procedures, because they're going to be able to say, hey, she's actually doing it. So I can do it too. And finally, express some appreciation. When someone is opening up to you, thank them. Thank them for their time, their vulnerability, their courage for sharing with you. That's going to create a safe space for them to feel like they can come back and do that again. We're going to shift in some generational differences. Now, there's a lot of differences in the workplace. We have very diverse and inclusive workplaces. The workforce is constantly changing. But a great introduction to this conversation is the generational differences that we have. We were mostly brought up with the golden rule. I remember growing up and early in my adult professional career, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I'm sure you've heard it. That assumes similarities. That assumes we all want and need the same thing out of every situation is shifting to a titanium rule. You need to do unto others, keeping their preferences in mind. And that's accepting diversity. That's not what you want or what you need in the moment. That's taking into consideration that very individual person on the other end of that conversation. 
if we dive a little deeper into the diverse workforce that we have, we're made up of mostly these four generations. These references are pulled from Purdue Global, and we've got our boomers. They're the competitive workaholics, mostly. They prefer the handwritten note mailed to your home. Most of them believe that their age equals seniority in an organization, in a department, and in a job title. Then we've got our Generation X. They tend to be a little bit more flexible and independent. They prefer efficiency over the way we've always done it. They were really the first ones to question, why are we doing it this way? And they were faced with a lot of pushback, which has created their resiliency in the workplace. We have our millennials. They're very achievement oriented. They're almost looking for a badge of honor for the things that they're doing. They prefer an email or a text versus where a Gen Xer or a baby boomer might prefer an in-person conversation or a phone call. They actually will make up 75% of our workforce in 2025. Are you ready to be able to manage that workforce? And as our Gen Zs get introduced more and more to our workplaces, we need to be mindful of their entrepreneurial spirit. It's a really incredible thing that they've got but they are so different in the sense that they're shifting towards a focus around social media. That's how they communicate with each other. They would rather send somebody a DM or a Snapchat versus an email, a text, or an in-person conversation. And lastly, they don't think about work-life balance. They think about life-work balance. So they're more focused on having that time off to be able to do all the things they want and need to do to tap into that entrepreneurial spirit. When they take a job, they're more focused on a flexibility of a schedule, PTO, and the things that are going to support the personal lifestyle that they want to live. Another thing we can do to break down some of those walls between the generations is just leading with trust. That's one of the more difficult things, moving into a leadership role or even just delegating in any other role of being able to trust someone. But using those words with a coworker or someone that reports to you, and just saying, I trust you, that can open up an entire world that you didn't know existed before. Wow. Michelle trusts me. I'm going to make sure I do a good job for her because I don't want to let her down. They show appreciation for that. Of course, you can't trust blindly. As leaders, you want to trust but validate. But extending that to them without delegating a task and then micromanaging it all the way through will have a very different outcome than allowing them some freedom to use the skills that you know that they have to execute. We need to be mindful with these generations in the workplace that we can't do things the way that we always have. It's just not realistic. The world's changing too fast. Of course, we want to utilize and maximize technology, but we have to do that creatively while not completely omitting the human factor. We have to create a positive algorithm. Think about your social media algorithm. And what's in maybe your TikTok feed right now or your Instagram reels? Um, I'll be vulnerable and share. So my algorithm is mostly Kansas City Chiefs, <laughs> Taylor Swift, uh, and some skincare, right? Because that's the algorithm that I've created through liking things, commenting, sharing. You have an algorithm in real life, too. Your algorithm in real life is determined by your mindset. You have to be able to shift that if maybe your day didn't get off to a great start. I'll be vulnerable and share again. Um, as a huge Kansas City Chiefs fan, about half of my year's mood is determined around whether my team wins or loses. But I have to know that if they lose on a Sunday or Monday night, 
I've got to be able to show up the next day and not be grumpy about it, right? That's going to come out in emails. That's going to come out in meetings. And I've just got to be able to smile and laugh about it and, you know, maybe take one for the team because I'm probably going to get a dig or two if my team lost. But if you're not being able to focus and redirect a negative algorithm or anyone on your team who has a negative algorithm, things will start to spiral very quickly and those things very quickly get out of control. When there's a negative algorithm, people start going down that algorithm with them because that's what they're being exposed to, just like social media. So we have to be able to manage that as leaders. Having those open lines of communication will build trust. And some things that I continue to learn as I continue to, de to develop as a leader is you can't expect the other person to build that line of communication for you. So you can say that you're here for them. You can ask if they're okay. The reality of humans are we're almost always going to respond. I'm okay. I'm fine, even when we're not. So really proactively going to them, taking the initiative of scheduling time with them, even if you don't think that maybe there's something to talk about, you're probably going to learn so much through those interactions. And that's going to create trust that then they'll start to take the initiative because they've seen that you've reached out to do that. We want to empower our employees to become cultural ambassadors and creators. You want to make an experience that they won't forget. Essentially roll out a red carpet for them. Re-recruit every day and focus on the positive, leading by example. We're going to dive a little deeper into each of those. Making an experience they won't forget doesn't have to be as elegant as a literal red carpet. If you want to do that, more power to you. That'd be a really cool experience. And I'm sure they wouldn't forget it. But what I mean by that is you want to make them feel like they're a part of something bigger. I still remember my first day of orientation in my first healthcare facility as a volunteer. And I remember seeing the executives, the leadership team, the HR team, and how everyone rallied together, the room full of people, learning about the culture and the mission of the organization. And I really thought in that moment, wow, this is a calling. I'm really a part of something bigger here. This is so much different than the job I had before. I could see this being a career. And that was day one, the first hour of being a part of that organization. So you have to think about those first impressions because they are lasting ones. You want to make everyone feel important in their own unique way. Our teams are so diverse. There's going to be gifts that everyone has. And, and another tip for you is you might really like your own way, of being, but that doesn't make a diverse team. You need to have people different from you, a different mindset from you, a different work ethic from you to be able to make a whole team. And acknowledging them for who they are in that moment is so important because it makes them feel important in their own way. Maybe some people are more available than others. Maybe some people are just so peopley they're able to build those connections on a whim. And those are gifts. You want to be able to honor those people for bringing those things to your workplace. Most importantly, you want to make them excited to come back. You want them to leave that first day or that interaction like, wow, I want to come back tomorrow and I want to do a great job. I want to make sure I do myself proud and my organization proud. You want to re-recruit every day. Empower your team to do the same. Empower your team to focus on the positive. As leaders, as HR professionals, you have to manage the employee perception because the perceptions that you don't manage have already become a rumor or gossip in your department or your organization. What will set you apart from others is your ability to manage that perception. And one thing that will most definitely set you apart is if you actually follow up and close the loop. If someone asks you to do something, asks you a question, you need to be able to do, go full circle. Because if you don't, it becomes over time, what's the point of even mentioning anything? 
Lastly, focus on the positive. I've got two slides for this one. First, we're gonna give some framework around those difficult conversations. Here's three examples of a negative or positive approach to a situation. So the negative approach to the first example would be, I don't think that's gonna work. We don't have bandwidth. I'm sure that sounds familiar to some of you. There's actually a positive spin that you can have to that conversation. I appreciate you sharing that with me. Give me some time to think through how we might be able to partner on a solution that'll work for everybody. You started with yes, even though you might land somewhere closer to no, but you're not shutting them, them down um, and you're letting them know you're willing to work on a solution. Another example is where were you? You were late again. A positive spin to that would be, hey there, is everything okay? I noticed you were late again. Last time we talked, you mentioned you had some things going on at home. I wanna check if everything's all right. You had me worried. It's okay as an HR team member or as a leader to genuinely care about someone. Once you do that, you create a very different connection. Yes, there's a very fine line that you don't wanna cross, but investing in them as actual individuals versus a number or an employee is going to make a world of difference. And the last example I want to give to help you manage that perception and focus on the positive is office gossip. There's a lot of it out there. It's in every organization, and we'd be silly to say that it just doesn't happen. We can't turn a blind eye to it. And the worst thing that we can do as HR team members or as leaders is to say absolutely nothing. Because when someone brings up gossip and we say nothing, they're being empowered to not only share it again, but they actually might think it's true. So some examples, did you hear about so-and-so? Instead of saying, oh yeah, I did, we can't do that, right? We need to say something more like, oh, well, how about we just focus on the facts and not rumors to be able to shut down that conversation? Maybe an employee is coming to you that so-and-so is never on time. Instead of saying, I know, or it's such a problem, or yeah, this happens all the time, or we're, even we're working on it, a different response, a more positive response would be, how are you gonna help them through this? So these are some examples that you can use to be able to focus on the positive. I really hope that these tips were helpful for you Again, I want to thank you for your time. If you have questions that we can't get to, you can email me, connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. But I really appreciate the time and being able to share this with you. Great. And uh, Michelle, there are some audience questions if you have some time. Sure. Um, here's a question. What specific steps can be taken to address and mitigate trust issues stemming from generational differences in the workplace? So my visceral response to that is you've got to just be really vulnerable about it. Um, you've got to be able to understand what the real challenges are. And another place that you have to really focus on is making sure that your entire leadership is trained on being able to speak to these things, understand them, understand the appropriate words to use, because we may not realize they might be contributing to some of that conversation and if they are, that's only going to exacerbate those challenges that we already have. Great. And I think we can squeeze in one more question. Sure. How do you suggest leaders handle the delicate balance between transparency and confidentiality yeah. to maintain trust? Yeah. Um, so some suggestions I have around that, you know, I, I work in HR. I also work on things like a workplace violence prevention committee, and I get a ton of, you know, risk and uh, confidential information. But what employees really want is to be heard and they want to know something's being done. And it's okay to say, we received you know, your concerns. I need you to know I've escalated it. I need you to know we're working on it. Thank you for trusting me to be able to find a solution. I may not be able to tell you the exact outcome of what happens. I just need you to know 
something's being done and I need you to feel comfortable if something were to happen again, that you can come back to me so we can continue working through this. So you can respond without giving them the full detail. Great. Well, thank you again, Michelle, for an awesome keynote. Thank you so and much. And I want to thank everyone else for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. As a reminder, please be sure to check out the prizes and raffle rules section to see how you can earn points for the chance to win one of several prizes. Our next session will begin at 1135 a.m. Eastern Time, which will be a panel discussion titled, Oh, the Humanity, Transformative HR Technologies, AI, and Beyond. Please click the join button that will appear on your screen to be redirected to the next session, and we look forward to seeing you there.